morning, everybody. Good morning. So, um, I suppose today is going to be a mixture of a couple things. Um, we're going to finish off. Well, I'm going to finish off the the lecture slides that we started last Thursday. Part two was on Tuesday. Today is going to be part three, and the final bit. Shut the door, please. Um, and it won't take us the entire class period because um, because, because of my marathon uh, lecturing on Tuesday, <laughs> I didn't realize that I had gone past 12 quite a bit. Um, anyway, that has given us more time today, which is good because I have a feeling that there are going to be questions about the the labs now that they're coming due and now that you have the earthquake lab to work on too. So um, I'm hoping that some of you have actually tried the virtual earthquake and tried um, that lab. And you'll let me know if there are questions about how that works. You know, it's the first time that I've used those worksheets. I've done, I've used the virtual earthquake site many times before, um, but it's the first time I've used those worksheets. And so I'm not exactly sure if um, they're, they'll be easy to work with and, and quite clear. So that's what I'm talking about. Okay. Um, Let's go. I'm going to share the island screen with you real quick, just to remind you that um, I've put a study guide for the exam, the first exam here. You should be using the online quizzes that you've been taking on iLearn the which summarize which cover your textbook reading basically. Um, the lecture slides and the labs are what you want to go over for the exam. It's basically everything. But I highlight the things in the lecture um, that I want that I want to make sure that you learn in this class. And so if there are topics that come up in the textbook that I don't talk about in class, that's a way of me saying that it maybe that's a less important topic. Any questions about the exam um, now that you have had a chance maybe to look at that study guide and to um, finish off those last bit of labs and start the virtual earthquake? Anything? Okay. Nothing so far. There's a question in the chat. Oh, thank you. Could you read it to me, actually? I could read it. Is this is is there a time limit for the exam? Um, I will limit the time. So um, I haven't I haven't written the exam yet. So I don't know how long it's going to be, but I promise that. I'm going to aim for not more than an hour. So what I said I would do on Tuesday was give you a time limit, but like double. So if I think it's going to be an hour exam, I'll give you at least two hours so that everybody has plenty of time. It's sort of limiting it so that you don't spend forever trying to look up the answers to the questions online or wherever. Um, I hope that I write the exam questions so that it's going to require thinking and not just Googling because I'm not into the memorization so much. Although I think it's fair enough to, um, let's say, give you a block diagram, like one of the cross sections from your relative age dating, dating lab um, and ask you to tell me what which one of Steno's laws, like the law of superposition or hor original horizontality, um, just leave it. Um, original horizontality, uh, cross-cutting relationships, 
um, you know, all of those that you used when you did that lab, I hope that you would be able to name those, you know, broadly. If, it, if you don't get the name exactly right, I'll, but you describe it well enough, um, that should be sufficient. However, in a case, you know, I'm probably gonna do like a multiple choice sort of question for that sort of thing. So I'll give you a choice of those. You don't have to recall them without any prompting. Um, so the answer is yes, there's a time limit. It's go I'm going to give you a generous time limit so that you have plenty of time to work. If you're a slow test taker, I wouldn't worry about finishing within the time limit because I think it's going to be enough, you know, double that you won't have to worry. Um, but I also don't want you to spend six hours on it. And you know what? That has happened before when I have had like allowed unlimited time. The, people take forever. And I don't think you're going to, you would get, um, I don't think you would get a lot of benefit from having an unlimited time exam, frankly, either. I think it's only just negative outcomes that way. So, um, okay. Is that good? Any other questions? So I said I said it would be a mixture of multiple choice, true, false, matching, short answer, um, and that I said I am definitely going to use um, diagrams and have you interpret them or tell me about them, um, things that you've used in or that we've seen in class, things that we've talked about in detail. I may ask you to sketch your own things, in which case you would probably do that by hand, take a picture and then up upload the picture. You guys can handle that, right? Is anyone not, does anyone feel not confident that, that they can do that? If you don't think that's a fair kind of a thing to do on the exam, I want to hear that because I think, I think you all are good at, with the, I think you can handle that. Any others? I can, what we can do is I can finish off the lecture slides and that might bring up some other questions about earthquakes and seismology because that will be on the exam. Uh, I'll also, you know, we can run through virtual earthquake a little bit and I can show you how to measure the SP interval or how to measure the amplitude of the S wave to calculate the magnitude. Um, there are examples, they, they, they explain it in the virtual earthquake site. So um, I'm hoping that you'll be able to do that without me even. Okay, let me stop this and I am gonna, I've got Google Earth open and ready to answer questions later. There we go. Okay. Moment while I find the lecture slide for today. Oops, that's labs. Okay, here we go. And here we go. Okay. We were on slide 84, I think I recall. Good Lord. The cats just destroyed a science experiment. So that's the, the noise in the background is, um, <laughs> cleaning up. It was a baking soda and vinegar experiment for my fifth grader. Um, Were they making one of the little volcanoes with it or? <laughs> well, not exactly. Um, we didn't have time to do anything like that. She, she came to me this morning and was like, oh, I have a science experiment due <laughs> today. <laughs> I thought it wasn't due until like next week. What, what do I do? So, <laughs> yeah, I'm telling them about this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. Well, anyway, so in like five minutes, we had an experiment and then the one of the cats like jumped on the pan and flipped baking soda everywhere and broke the pan. So oh, no. <laughs> right, before, right before class started. Mm -hmm. Okay. This is, um, we did, I did point this out right before we finished, but um, I want to go back and make sure I spend enough time on it. Okay, so um, how much energy is released in an earthquake? So remember I said that the Richter magnitude, not the Mercalli scale, the Mercalli scale is this one that describes, it literally just describes the shaking and the damage that was happened, that, or the things that happened during the earthquake. So how much shaking and what you feel is transformed into one of these designations of like light, moderate, strong shaking. And it's given a Mercalli scale one through 10 in, in terms of the intensity. And you will see maps like that on the USGS site when you report an earthquake, they create um, a, like an ISO, their Mercalli scale, like isoplus, like zones where it's weak shaking furthest from the epicenter until strongest shaking closest to the epicenter. But the Richter scale is a quantitative uh, measure. Well, this one that goes from zero to 10. And this is directly related to the amount of energy that's released during an earthquake. And that's where we come up with this diagram. So this shows the earthquake magnitude here from zero to 10 and the corresponding energy released so that you can see the relationship. And then it's giving you the approximate energy equivalent. So a magnitude six earthquake is similar to that's what the 1994 Northridge earthquake was all about. We were talking about the blind thrusts in LA Basin, um, or even this atomic bomb test on Bikini Islands. So it, it, it can, they, these larger earthquakes are huge amounts of energy. I mentioned also that going from each going increasing in magnitude by one on the Richter scale. So if going from zero to one or four to five or seven to eight, that's a multiple of 32 times more energy for each increment. And that applies whether it's like, if it's a 2.4 to a 3.4, that's a, an increment of 1.0. That's what I mean. That's 32 times more energy. So it's an exponential scale. It's not a linear scale as far as increasing uh, magnitudes. This here, this plots the same thing. So er the earthquake moment magnitude, that's one way of calculating the, the magnitude, just like Richter magnitude, but it's slightly different than the Richter scale. This is thought to be more accurate. <clears throat> But we still talk about Richter scale in the same sort of way. And we still use those, those values as well from zero to, to 10. Okay, so this plots um, from magnitude two to magnitude 12. Uh, and there's, someone asked me at the end of class last Tuesday, whether there would ever be a magnitude 10 earthquake. And the answer is essentially no. We don't think that that's ever going to happen just based on what the earthquakes that have been measured and the estimates for the strength of the crust and lithosphere and how much of it might break and how much energy would be released. So it's thought that it, it would require a fault breaking that's so long that it's, it's not realistic. So um, less than 10 are, you know, from zero to less than 10 are what we're talking about. The, the, the 1960 earthquake in Chile 
that was a 9.5, that's probably the, the biggest that we're ever going to measure. Um, okay, so back to this little diagram. Because um, I think it's it's useful to make these comparisons. Like this is the Hiroshima atomic bomb here. That's almost the equivalent of a magnitude six earthquake, and magnitude six is six is still on the moderate side. That's not even really that strong of shaking. Um, the high sixes. That's where it starts to be really strong shaking. Um, but then we're talking about like the largest nuclear explosions the the u.s annual energy consumption is like a magnitude 10 so there's there's the upper limit for earthquakes meteorite impacts are up here but you know that's assuming a 10 kilometer wide meteor which is also huge that's like maybe extinction sized meteorite <laughs> impact okay uh, here's another way of demonstrating the exponential increase in energy that's given off by these different magnitude quakes from three to magnitude nine. So here's, um, there, this was 2011, the earthquake in, was that Kobe? I think this was the Kobe earthquake, um, was an 8.9. I don't know. There, there have been so many large earthquakes in Japan. I'm not sure which one it was. <laughs> um, and recall that I said that these really large earthquakes, the ones that are magnitude nine, are subduction zone earthquakes. We're not going to have extremely large earthquakes like that on a transform plate boundary like the San Andreas. So you know, the 1906 quake was a 7.2. Gosh, I just forgot. I think so. Um, it was definitely in the sevens. Um, so, you know, between seven and eight are, is what we might be limited to on a San Andreas type earthquake. So that's good. And I remember that I said that it was the shallow or the, the large but shallow earthquakes in subduction zones that cause the most damage because of the attenuation of those seismic waves, they die off with distance from the hypocenter. Remember those waves are going out in, in three dimensions in all directions in the crust. Uh, and the ones that reach the surface are the ones that, you know, those are the closest to the hypocenter compared to anywhere else. And so the shake the shaking will be greatest nearest the the hypocenter sorry the epicenter. Um, and if it's a large shallow quake, then the seismic waves don't have enough crust to pass through for those the energy to sort of dissipate um, that it reaches a population and causes damage. Okay, so. There are, I say three factors, but I list four because the fourth one is sort of secondary to these three. Uh, I'll explain. So the magnitude is the primary factor in the, the intensity of shaking that you're going to feel. So the larger the magnitude, the more shaking you're going to feel. And some of these earthquakes can also last a really long time. I think um, uh, the Loma Prieta earthquake, which was a 6.9 magnitude, that was um, that lasted 15 seconds, and that was enough to do a crazy amount of damage, set the marina on fire, destroyed a, our. It, it damaged the Bay Bridge, it collapsed the Cypress structure in Oakland. Um, so there was, it, it shifted houses in Las Gatas and Santa Cruz off their foundations. Um, all those soft story buildings in San Francisco collapsed. So um, that's a big factor. The distance from the fault is a big factor. So the closer you are from the fault and from the epicenter, I should add that. Um, because the, 
the closer you are to the epicenter, even if you're on the fault, the further away you are, the, the less energy there will be. So the less, the less shaking there will be. But um, if you're on the fault, that's a zone of weakness and that can spread out along that zone of weakness. So the fault itself is a dangerous place to be. Um, and the epicenter obviously is the closest place to the hypocenter. So the closest you, closer you are to the epicenter, the more shaking. The local soil conditions or soil and or, you know, rock, maybe I should say substrate, meaning whatever you're standing on or whatever the road is built on or the building is built on. That's what I'm talking about. Um, I'll say, how about substrate? So it, I'm, and I mentioned the bay muds and the artificial fill that was put in in the marina area around the SFO. San Mateo, uh, or sorry, not San Mateo, Foster City, um, which is just south of the airport, is built on fill. So there's a lot of fill along the bay, in addition to those bay muds and the sands um, that are um, that ha amplify the shaking. Um, so I see that there's a qu question in the chat box that says, what would happen to the cliff house during a seven to 8.0 magnitude earthquake? The cliff house is built on rock, isn't it? I mean, it's n maybe soft rock, but um, number one, those, houses along we can tell you what we'll go look at the cliff house together in google earth and we'll um or using the association of bay area government site we'll do this after the i finish the lecture slides and um, i'll give you an assessment okay the cliffs themselves can collapse those coastal cliffs they're already collapsing because number one they're really steep and you've got a lot of wave action happening. So storms and the wave action undercut the cliffs and the cliffs fall, fall down. They collapse onto the beach. And if a building like the cliff house is on one, it'll go with it. But I believe the cliff house is on rock. So the shaking will be less intense, but I don't wanna promise that until we look at one of those maps that shows shaking intensity during hypothetical quakes. We'll get there. Um, I have a question too. Yeah, go ahead. So um, you say local soil um, conditions and I notice it says soft loose soil will shake more. Does the presence of heavy vegetation change that at all since in general vegetation like prevents soil erosion and it helps it stay together better? Sure, yeah, but the, the plants and vegetation, their roots only go so deep. So if you're talking about grass, you know, the roots are probably only as deep as the grass blades. So they're not going to hold the soil together very well. Trees would help because their roots are deeper. Um, I think that that would help hold the soil together but the soil itself is still going to shake that same amount. So I think the vegetation is only going to help maintain that clump, that local clump of soil as a coherent block maybe, but I think the shaking is still going to be similar. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, so let's see. Okay, so I just point out some of the text here. It says that um, when you when the seismic waves pass from solid rock to soil, the seismic waves slow down a lot, but the amplitude gets bigger. So the amplitude of the shaking is higher. And that's what is causing the greater shaking. It's the increased amplitude of the seismic waves. Um, let's see. So for example, in the case of the Loma Prieta quake, and I'm hoping you all, if, if you are not familiar with the place names that I'm giving, and I'm hoping you all have at least lived in the Bay Area 
for some time, <laughs> some period of time, even if it's a little while. If you don't recognize these place names, I can show you them on the map. But let me know, put something in the chat or just say something. So the, the Loma Prieta epicenter was in the Santa Cruz Mountains in the South Bay between like San Jose and Santa Cruz. Um, some of the greatest damage was done in those areas in Santa Cruz, Los Gatos is so, just south of San Jose, smaller town. They had a lot of damage. They were close to the epicenter. But the Oakland Cypress structure and the San Francisco Marina area and the Bay Bridge, the seismic waves didn't do much damage at all along the peninsula or along the East Bay. It, it wasn't until it, they got the seismic waves reached that those bay muds and that artificial fill that the damage was done. So in fact, in those cases, the distance was less important than the local soil conditions. I just wanna make that point. Okay, and then the building type um, makes a difference. So for example, if you're in a high rise building, um, the shaking in the building, the, the, the way that the shaking passes through the actual structure means that you feel more shaking, you move more in a high rise building if you're at the top than if you're at the bottom. So you might, um, you know, a magnet, I remember there was one day I was in Thornton Hall, which is the building we're supposed to be having this class in, if it weren't for the pandemic, um, sitting at, in, on the 10th floor, which you can only get to from a set of stairs after you take the elevator to the ninth floor. It's up on the, the top of Thornton Hall. And we were in a meeting and there was an earthquake that had an epicenter somewhere in the East Bay. It was on the Hayward or the Calaveras Fault that the earthquake happened. Um, but we felt the shaking up there. Other people who were down on the fifth floor didn't feel it, um, especially if you were walking around, you might not notice a smallish earthquake from afar. So I think that was like a magnitude four or something or a high, maybe a 3.9 or something like that. Um, that's my example of like noticing shaking and people started to freak out and I was the, like there saying okay p wave s wave all right earthquakes done <laughs> and people are like should we evacuate no you're not supposed to run out of the building we're gonna get to some safety don't run out of the building stay inside during an earthquake uh, I'll explain more so are we good with the the factors that primary that you feel primarily I hope. Okay. Let's go here. Some of the information that you get when you go on the USGS website, and maybe I should pull that up um, while I'm talking, and then I can show it to you. I'm just going to go to the quake.usgs.gov site, and you can go there too if you want, if you have a small window. Um, I'll explain the beach ball diagrams and then we'll go find some on, on the, the USGS site. Okay, so they give you these beach ball diagrams. They have a fun name and even geophysicists refer to them as beach ball diagrams. Their proper name is their focal mechanism solutions. These show you whether, these are the three basic types you get a pattern that looks like this, like a checkerboard pattern, that is what you get for a strike slip fault. And they show you areas of compression, the, so the black or the gray areas are areas of compression, the direction, so these are quantitative, these are showing you the direction that the compression on those seismic waves, where the compression occurred, and where tension was. So these waves are kind of pushing and pulling as they're going through the earth in a sense. Think of the slinky example. And the, the way that these, the way that you read them is that the line separating these two, one of these is the solution and the other one is, so one represents the fault. So this red line, for instance, 
represents a strike slip fault like this. Um, and this is a right lateral strike slip fault. So you're getting compression in this direction and tension in this direction. And that beach ball, that kind of beach ball diagram says right lateral strike slip fault and the fault is here. So you need to know a little bit about the geography too to even figure out like which one is the solution. Um, the other kinds you get, might get are one for a thrust fault that looks like this where the compression is on top and on bottom of the, of the beach ball. And in this case, this plane, so these literally represent spheres. And so the lines are actually planes that cut that sphere. And this plane is the one that, re that represents this thrust fault. Here's a, what a normal fault, a normal earthquake looks like, or a fault, uh, sorry, an earthquake on a normal fault would look like. So the compression, so there's tension in the center on the top and on the bottom of that beach ball diagram. So imagine that you're pulling the earth, the crust apart, and you're dropping down that hanging wall block. Well, that's the tension. You're feeling the tension in that down drop block. That's how that's read. And I don't know how to solve these, right? I don't know how to get this as a solution. I'm just saying that when you go onto the USGS site, they, they show you a beach ball diagram. And from that, what you can tell and this is the only thing that I want you to get out of this, is that what you can learn when you see the beach ball diagram is, was it on a strike slip? Did the earthquake happen on a strike slip fault or a thrust fault or a normal fault? And that can tell you something about the tectonics. So um, when an earth, as soon as the beach ball diagram is available, like when an earthquake hits and you go to the site, which I do because I'm a science geek, go to the website, look it up. Um, it's not always there at first. Like you might get an initial estimate of the magnitude and the location and the depth, but they refine that when they get more data and they work the solution um, more accurately. But when they, when these do appear, then you can say, aha, it was, it was a strike slip. It must have been on, it must have been on the San Andreas. Or maybe sometimes you see it was a thrust fault that was offshore. Okay, maybe that's related to the subduction going on in the, the Juan de Fuca plate. Or a normal fault maybe on an oceanic spreading center. So you might be able to like tell that from these diagrams. And I just included all of this because it gives you different examples. There's a strike slip fault. There's a normal fault. Here's a thrust fault uh, or motion on a thrust fault. These represent motion. Um, here's, this is trans tension, which means it's like transform and tension. So it's um, strike slip fault and it's tensional. So it's a little bit thrust fault and a little bit strike slip fault. Here's a little bit um, transpression, which is like a combination of compression and shearing. So strike slip faulting with compression. So thrust fault and strike slip fault motion. I've told you that um, and the, the general name that you give to a diagram like this is oblique. <laughs> like you don't need more terminology. You don't need to memorize this. I'm just saying that you, you might just call that an oblique sense. So oblique might mean instead of strike slip fault motion like this, you're getting strike slip with a little bit of vertical motion, but it's mostly strike slip, strike slip with a little bit of vertical or strike slip and a little bit of tension. That's what they mean. Um, I have a question. You bet. So um, why exactly are the beach ball diagrams spherical? Like what are they trying to convey like dimension wise being a sphere as opposed to the block? Oh, okay. That the makes earth. Think of the total think sense. of the earth. Yeah. Okay, that makes or, sense. Or a piece of earth that is surrounding the fault. Maybe that's better. Like imagine just a sphere. It could be a mini earth, whatever, however you want to imagine it. 
a sphere of earth around the fault. And so when the fault breaks, you're, you're seeing the projection of that fault plane in the sphere. Okay. Yeah. Is that good enough? I hope. Yeah. It's just, I'm so used to seeing block diagrams all the time. And so the sphere thing, I was just trying to figure out like, why is it a sphere? What's it conveying? Yeah. Okay. That okay. makes sense. I'm going to take you, I'm going to finish the lecture and then I'm going to take you to these other sites. I'll take you to the USGS and I'll take you to the Association of Bay Area Government site to show you what you can learn on your own after class. Okay. Um, so there are some other hazards that come along with earthquake shaking. You know, there's the shaking is one thing, but um, there are also landslide hazards. This is an example, and this is probably a mud flow, um, but landslides that can travel a long way. This happens to be an example in Peru. The Santa Cruz Mountains, if I showed you that map of potential landslides um, earlier in the same set of lecture slides, there are many landslides all over the place in the mountains, especially during the rainy season when the soils are more, more prone to failing. Fire is a big one. So there, this happens to be after the Loma Prieta quake the there was fire in San Francisco. Why? In part because gas lines are ruptured and things can spark a fire relatively easily. Someone lighting a cigarette or someone turning the gas on um, after a quake can do it. So you need to be aware of that. Um, ground rupture is another example. This is one from Turkey. So this is probably on the North Anatolian Fault. But that's pretty spectacular. I would love to see that one day. I haven't seen that. Oh, good. The neighbor is, or the neighbor has somebody um, leaf blowing next door. All right. I've showed you, why did I want to show this one? I think we're going to skip through these relatively quickly, but I just wanted to show you um, maps of California that give you sort of the probability of having these large earthquakes. So a 30 year earthquake probability from basically 100% to zero with the red being closer to 100% and the blue or whites being zero. So look at the San Andreas. It comes out of the Salton Sea here. This section east of, ah, east of LA and there are a couple of I, this must this might be another named fault or it could be a strand of the San Andreas. Sometimes faults will split off into different strands so that um, the the slip might be divided along two different fault planes. Um, but this, the Coachella Valley is probably at the highest risk anywhere on the San Andreas fault. I said in the Bay Area, the highest probability of having one of these largest large earthquakes is on the Hayward Fault, so in the East Bay. But that doesn't, you know, that doesn't help us here on the San Andreas. There's still pretty high probability of having an earthquake on a large magnitude earthquake on the San Andreas in the Bay Area as well. But those are the two key areas. And that's reflected in the seismicity that we see along the along these different faults in California. So that says, I can't read the date. This is from, um, okay, so green is 1932 to 2000. Red, or blue is 1869 to 1931. Red is 1769 to 1868. So this is 1769 through 2000. So this must be a recreation or an estimate from all of the, the trench work that has been done so they can look at the offsets on faults in the trenches that they dig across faults and estimate the size and location of of different earthquakes historically because they didn't have seismometers measuring these back in 1769 right so that has to be from trench work notice where most of it is in southern california east of la 
divided between the Calaveras and Hayward faults and the San Andreas in the Bay Area. There's a bit of activity in the Eastern Sierra and then in Mendocino. So this is the offshore. So this is getting to the end of the San Andreas where it reaches that triple junction with the, NAS, the Juan de Fuca plate and the, the Pacific plate and the North American plate come together. So it's kind of messy seismicity there. Okay. Uh, I think I've kind of done this to death. I don't wanna, you guys have seen these now enough, I think, <laughs> haven't you? <laughs> the, I'll point them out one last time. The San Gregorio Fault is here offshore. So if you live out in Half Moon Bay, you can probably see surface expressions of the San Gregorio where it clips, it clips that um, the shoreline very near the Half Moon Bay airport. And there's a, a hill there that marks the San Gregorio Fault. The San Andreas has pretty high probability of quakes. Here's the Calaveras in purple. That's the one that goes down through um, Hollister. There, I was going to forget it for a minute. So Hollister isn't just a brand, it's a place <laughs> um, where there's creeping along the Calaveras Fault and you can see offset um, curbs, fences, even today. Here's the Hayward Fault that it turns into the Rogers Creek Fault in the North Bay. And then we've got the um, Green Valley and, sorry, I'm trying to read without my glasses and it's not working, Concord, that's what it is. The Green Valley Concord Fault system that's in the, um, on the other side of the East Bay Hills. So we're surrounded. And one last time I'm gonna say, all of these faults together comprise the plate boundary between the Pacific and the North American plate. So if we were to look at the total, you're, you know, you're measuring, you're estimating the motion on these plates in lab 5B, um, that motion is divided up across all of these faults. So together they, um, they share that, that offset. All right. No, I'm just gonna keep, I'm just gonna move on. Yeah, I'm just gonna move on. Well, okay, there's one thing I'll say because this shows topography here. Um, notice, here's the fault. So this is the, here, this is the San Andreas. That's the San Gregorio. Here's the Hayward. There's the Calaveras. All right, notice that the topography Okay, there's topography here, Santa Cruz Mountains, and then it gets pretty flat down here. And then you have some hills again here. The hills are literally between the Hayward Fault and the Calaveras Fault. This, the hills are where they are in the Santa Cruz Mountains and in the East Bay because of oblique motion on those strike slip faults. So where does oblique come in? <clears throat> Remember I said that there's a slight vertical motion uh, on these faults when they move. So the North American side of the, of the San Andreas Fault drops down a little bit and the Pacific Plate side rises up a little bit, just a small fraction, maybe like less than 10% of the motion is vertical compared to horizontal motion on the fault. And that actually down drop the entire bay between the two faults, between the Hayward and the San Andreas. So the Hayward fault is dropping down the bay side relative to the East Bay Hills. The Calaveras is dropping down the Sacramento side and rising up the, the East Bay Hills. So together those faults are giving us the hilly topography and the down drop bay. So it's almost like a basin and range type topography, but along mostly strike slip faults. Does everyone get that concept? 
that the bay is here and we have this low topography because of oblique motion on those faults. I hope so. Say so if you've got questions. Okay, some of the geology. So we've been looking at maps of San Francisco and I told you that- um, Sorry, There's a question in the chat. Oh, go ahead, hit me. Where is it? Um, um, are those hills between Half Moon Bay and San Mateo that you drive through on 92 mark the San Andreas Fault? Are the hills, okay, so when you cross on 92, you cross the San Andreas Fault when you go between the two reservoirs. Um, there are, uh, I think I'm gonna show you pictures in a moment. Do I have a picture of it? I don't see it offhand real quick. There's a Crystal Springs and the San Andreas Reservoirs that are on the west side of two, Highway 280 and they're long skinny lakes reservoirs. Um, the San Andreas goes straight through the middle of all of them. So before you go up the hill on 92 to get to Half Moon Bay, like even before you start moving uphill on the low part between, there's like a little bridge across the reservoir there, that's the fault. Okay, I hope that answers the question. The hills themselves are there because of uplift, that the oblique motion on the fault though. Okay, where am I? Here, okay, so I'm gonna get to the geology. So the, there are the Francis, so the, the, the San, Franci San Francisco and the peninsula um, are Franciscan type rocks, those are those um, ophiolitic material. So the pillow basalts, the cherts, there are sandstones, there are serpentinites that are all part of that Franciscan, those Franciscan rocks. That's what you see in the colored areas here on this map of San Francisco. Those form the hills in San Francisco. Then there are the bay muds and those creek val the the creek depressions that um, have those that intense shaking and then I pointed out there were s formerly sand dunes on the northeast part so sunset the golden you know um, uh, the Castro uh, Golden Gate Park the sunset district down by um, San Francisco State it's all old sand dunes so a little bit more shaking, but better than the bay muds. But if you're building or if the city is built on rock, shaking is reduced. And that's why I'm showing you these. Here's um, the, this is a geology map. And next to it is a map of liquefaction and landslide hazards. So here are those sands, the, the former sand dunes in yellow. And then we've got some, um, I don't know exactly what this unit is, QC. Um, co is coma formation. So those are, there are some sedimentary rocks that are under here. Uh, yeah, sedimentary rocks, Merced formation, coma formation. Okay, so similar to, um, the rocks that you looked at in your fossils lab, sandstones like that. And they, they are fossiliferous. You can go down to um, Thornton. It's not Thornton Beach. There's a beach down here where all the hang gliders go. I want to say Thornton, but that's not it. It's like, it starts with a T. Um, where, if you drive down Skyline or head toward Ocean Beach, you'll see the hang gliders. It is that beach um, south of Ocean Beach where the Merced Formation crops out and the, it's really fossiliferous. So you can go there anytime and look in the cliffs for fossils, especially after storms, big chunks will fall off of the cliff face. So be careful. Um, don't go under anywhere that's overhanging because it's loose and could fall. But new stuff, new fossils are exposed all the time out there. Um, but what I wanted to show you was this, the fact that the, the shaking is amplified 
in places in the gray and the blue in places where the rock isn't. So the shaking is less, or the amplitude of those seismic waves are less in the hilly terrain. Um, I suppose there, there's a higher risk of um, landslides though in the hills, particularly the steep hills. Okay, this is a landslide uh, map or map of potential landslides, a map of liquefaction susceptibility. Notice that it's just the bay lands all along the bay. Um, the landslides makes more sense that it's in the hills and along the coast. That's what this map says. Okay, I'm going to make some progress here on the slides because I want to leave time for the labs. This is this site. This is the Metropolitan Transportation Commission (MTC) and the Association of Bay Area Governments. They have an interactive map that I wanted to make part of your lab, but they've changed it. And I can't figure out a way for you to search different addresses on that site. It's really a pity. But you can go there and this button that's like a round circle, that, that will locate you wherever your internet signal is coming from. And so it'll put a dot on the map and you can plot, shake, like you can choose to plot by ticking these boxes, whether you want earthquake shape shaking on the San Gregorio Fault or on the San Andreas Fault. And then it will give you a map of your local area and you can see where your house or your apartment building or whatever, your, tra your RV, wherever you're living, you can see what the shaking intensity would look like. So this is a peninsula, so uh, an earthquake on the peninsula segment of the San Andreas Fault the shaking is most intense uh, along the fault trace and then a little bit farther away from the fault trace is still pretty intense shaking but it dies off and it dies off the farther away you get same with an earthquake on i don't remember which one this is i didn't write it down i guess they're both peninsula earthquakes yeah this looks like just actually this is just a zoomed in version of this isn't it it totally is. Okay. This is what it looks like up close. So um, you're seeing the trace in this dark line. The shaking doesn't, the, the dark area that shows the most intense shaking, it isn't parallel to the trace exactly because this is where local soil conditions come into play. Um, notice that that's the airport um, and there's fill down there. Um, to create the runways and everything for the airport. So that shows a lot of shaking in an earthquake, as you would expect with artificial fill. This is the map for an earthquake on the north segment of the Hayward Fault. So somewhere up here, maybe Berkeley, Oakland. And this is an earthquake on the South Hayward Fault. So maybe Fremont or Hayward, there's Fremont. And then, um, so the shaking is still, again, along the trace of the fault, but surrounding the epicenter area. Um, again, high shaking along the trace, and then it dies off away. The, when, when you watch that video that I've assigned for you to watch, the um, uh, where the fault lies is what it's called. There's a link in your lab folder, a link in the lecture folder too. Please go watch that on YouTube. It will walk you through just how many, it's in, they do an aerial flyover of the Hayward Fault that's pretty impressive. And it shows you how many schools, how many freeways, how many government buildings, how many like BART tracks, water pipelines, that that fault intersects that crosses over so a strikes at fault crossing over a per, like a pipeline that's perpendicular or a roadway like highway 24 is bisected by the fault um there's going to be a lot of damage when we have when that fault breaks when the hayward has its big earthquake 
this is what's going to happen. There's going to be a lot of damage to these types of facilities. Roadways will need repairing. There'll be lots of detours. People may need to have like import water in because the water lines might be broken. They'll have to shut gas lines off. Um, there'll be a lot of implications. This goes into more detail. So there are, you know, when Loma Prieta hit, that sort of size earthquake, a 6.9 when it hits on the Hayward Fault, these are the project, projected what's going to happen. 80,000 to 160,000 homes or apartment units will become uninhabitable. So that's 10 times the number that became uninhabitable during the Loma Prieta quake. That's the difference in the population along the fault. Um, as many as 1,700 road, roads closed, 12 times the number that happened in the Loma Prieta quake. Um, only some parts of the BART system will be operable. There are government agencies who work on this, who retrofit facilities to try to um, help prepare for those quakes, so to reduce the amount of damage or prevent damage if possible. Uh, personally, what I think what I'm going to give you sort of an assignment of what personally I want you to do. I want you guys to especially know where are you going to go when an earthquake happens. If you're sitting right where you're sitting right now, I'm assuming you're at home. If an earthquake were to hit right now, where would you go? Think about that for a second. Where's the sturdiest desk or table or something wooden or metal that you can fit your body under? Even if it's a coffee table, at least you can get your head and shoulders under it. Protect your head. That's the most important part. Leave your legs out. If you can just get your head under a coffee table even, that's a good thing. But you know, where are your family members gonna go? If everybody's at home right now, you all have to share that. Don't run under a doorway. That's not the first place to go because a lot of doorways aren't, aren't really built to withstand a lot of shaking. It's that heavy furniture that's probably your best bet. And if nothing else, move away from windows. Move away from any heavy furniture like a fridge or like um, a tall cabinet that, um, that you've got your TV on or something. Get away from those unless they're strapped to the wall. And I'm gonna give you some recommendations for that. All right. Um, as far as water systems are concerned, San Francisco and a lot of the Bay Area gets its water from Hetch Hetchy. This is Hetch Hetchy, the reservoir. It's like another Yosemite Valley, really. And there are people, I think like the, the um, Sierra Club, argue that we should drain Hetch Hetchy and make it, let it restore to its natural conditions um, and to use that as a wilderness instead of as a, a dam and a reservoir. But then where do we get all of our water? Where do we store it? Hetch Hetchy is here in the Sierra. And there are pipelines. And this is schematic. This is not exactly to scale or um, even correct in terms of lo exact location of these places. It's schematic. Hetch Hetchy brings the water down across um, the San Joaquin Valley and in through the South Bay. And those pipelines then go to San Francisco from the South Bay. So now think about where the faults are. The Calaveras cuts across the water lines here. The Hayward cuts across here. The San Andreas cuts across in the South Bay. So those water lines, and these have been there for a long time. This is a historical map showing the same places. Um, there's gonna be a lot of damage. Here's something I didn't know. There are what are called cisterns or supplies of water that the city stores. Everywhere there's one of these little circles is 
a place like this in the in the roadway that represents a cistern so there's a water supply under there like a mini reservoir in case something like this happens we have a backup who knew i didn't and probably you didn't i'm guessing um why am i showing you this again this is another one of those this is like an epicenter on the north hayward fault but oh this is a mercalli scale map that's why i wanted to show it to you so this is the mercalli scale from one to ten it's done in roman numerals instead of richter magnitude which is like number one through number ten so this is roman numeral one through roman numeral four etc and this is the sort of legend that you'll see on the usgs site this is what that map would look like um, if there was a large quake on the North Hayward Fault. So we're talking magnitude 9 and 10 shaking, which is pretty violent shaking in the east, all across the East Bay, in, in the hills and down in the lowlands. So if you live in the East Bay, you really should be prepared for an earthquake at home. And uh, like I said, I'm going to show you a few things you can do. There was a historical quake. There's a, a magnitude seven, they estimate, in 1868. And this is what the shake map would have looked like based on that reconstruction from the trench. Uh, so it hasn't, we haven't had one, a, a large quake on the Hayward in a very long time. It's now almost 170, wait, 100 and that's 30, 20, 150, almost 60 years. We're getting to be on like this recurrence interval. Like if you were to average out when we get, like how often we get these large quakes, um, we're due for another one. But you know, these, these are averages. They're not like schedules for earthquakes. So we're due, but it could be another 160 years before one happens. But all the probabilities are saying that within the next 30 years, we're really likely to have one. I think I'm be beating the dead horse at this point. Okay, I wanna tell you about some of the um, things that happen to, to help with reduction in damage along when earthquakes happen and along these fault lines. So we ha now have mapped out fault zones. So this is a map of the Hayward Fault in the Oakland area. And um, this shows a zone where they, they the government agencies require looking at for induced the earthquake induced landslides or being aware of the earthquake and possibility of earthquake induced landslides in the Oakland Hills. Um, they are, there are areas where there's investigation on the impact of liquefaction in certain places. So they extend their fingers like this all throughout Oakland. The trace of the fault is known and there are some building restrictions along the fault zones, but it's really not enough. They only extend out about um, 50 feet from either side of an earthquake fault. This is showing the lowlands, so it's Alameda and the lowlands in Oakland. Um, this is the percentage of area predicted to liquefy during a magnitude 7.1 earthquake. It's a large area of the lowlands there and of the, the, the base, like the maze area before you get on the Bay Bridge. Uh, does, does, I think I'm making my point that there's, there's great potential. I've mentioned the Coachella Valley. So here are these, the faults that, this is a map of all of the different fault lines that are throughout the LA basin and the surrounding mountains. There are faults everywhere. Many, and I told you that the 1994 earthquake in Northridge, which was up here, 
um, was on a blind thrust. So it wasn't even, it ha wasn't even a mapped fault. They, we didn't know that there was a fault there. And that's where the earthquake happened on that fault. The greatest shaking is likely to happen on this, along the trace of the San Andreas. And it's out here, somewhere between the Salton Sea and Riverside that um, the big one is expected. I'm glad it's not up here. And I think there are only a few of you down in LA that are taking this class, so it's good luck. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> if you're in L, I mean, be prepared. You gotta prepare yourself. You gotta know what you're gonna do in a quake. Here's the Mercalli scale map of where the very violent shaking will happen. It's all along the fault trace and down into the LA basin. So LA is in Long Beach is going to feel it when that happens because of the local soil conditions. And then shaking even on the other fault traces that are nearby, that will be amplified. Um, same thing, this is a map of intensity of shaking. You just say that it, it, it's all, there are many places where there will be intense shaking during these quakes. Oh, this is a little video showing you the area of ground rupture that's estimated from these historical quakes. So from 1100 to 1857, and it's just going to pop up the segments. There's 1100. There's 1346. Here's 1480. 1680, 1812, and 1857. So there's a history and you can calculate an average sort of recurrence interval for these big earthquakes. But the last one being in 1857, again, we're due for another one. Um, let's see. I feel like I have too many of these maps now. I feel like I want to move forward, but I did want to compare the 1906 and the 1898, 1989 earthquakes. First, the rupture area. So the blue line shows the area of earth that was ruptured along the surface when Loma Prieta happened. It was only in the Santa Cruz mountains. Um, the 1906 rupture was from like, Salinas to Mendocino. Oh my God. The whole, there was ground rupture along the whole thing. That's crazy. Um, the shaking intensity comparison. So here's Loma Prieta with intense shaking Santa Cruz to the Bay Area. Um, in, in 1906, it was even more intense in Santa Cruz than the Bay Area, and it extended all the way up the coast to Mendocino. <clears throat> the epicenter for 1906 was just outside the Golden Gate Bridge. Here's the, the seismogram that was recorded in Germany, in Göttingen, in 1906. This was the shaking. Here's the shaking during Loma Prieta. I, th I think you get the point of this. The amplitude is even still really quite high um, in, on the seismometers, even in Germany. They didn't feel a shaking. This is just what the seismometers picked up. This is the Loma Prieta earthquake, the, the data for that quake. It shows you the latitude and longitude of the epicenter. These are snapshots of what you would see on the USGS site. So it gives you the depth so where on the fault plane, this is 17 kilometers deep, um, gives you the time, gives you a bunch of other information. Here's the beach ball diagram for it. So what does it tell us? It says that it was transtensional actually. So this is, um, the tension is on the top and the bottom of this beach ball kind of. So it's more like normal motion. So it's a down drop block instead of compressional up, uplifted block motion. So it's mostly trans, transtensional, sorry, mostly transform, mostly strike slip along this plane. And then there was a component of, of tension, so of normal motion, but just a small amount. You can see it's mostly normal and just, I don't know, maybe, 
20%, maybe 15% was normal motion. So if we had five centimeters of slip, let's say on that, during that earthquake, one centimeter would be normal motion. Five would, or four would be right lateral strike slip. This is the shake map for 1989. We've done this enough, but this is like the shake map that we would see on the USGS. It shows, and you can zoom in to see all these things too. Shows you the whole, you know, the area from Salinas to San Francisco sh shook a lot. This is the seismicity um, so, uh, at, during and after the Loma Prieta quake. So the blue dot is the epicenter for the 1989 quake. There were a lot of aftershocks. The earth kind of settles, gets back into its settled position. I don't know how else to describe it. It has still potential energy, and until that potential energy is like reduced when the the stresses are completely released, um, it will quiet down again. But there were there were a lot of aftershocks. Um, yeah, I included too many of these. We are just gonna go for it. So 1906, again, it was pretty violent. There was quite violent shaking. So the, the, this would have knocked houses off their foundations, knocked over brick buildings, knocked over brick chimneys, um, all in around here. Here's some pictures after 1906 showing evidence of liquefaction. So you see the tilted buildings or maybe soft stories. I don't know if these had garages under them. Uh, maybe there are a lot of soft story, story buildings in San Francisco, but this tilting and the, the, they're falling off their foundations, that's related to liquefaction. Um, this map shows just the northern part of, or the northeastern part of the San Francisco map, um, where all the fires formed. So um, Marina District, Financial District, down into Soma, I guess is what that is. You guys might not know the geography better, but I think that's about right. This is Market Street um, and the fires that took place. So there were a lot of fires. This is the day one, day two, day three extent of the fires sort of thing. Okay, so this is what I want you guys to do. You need to know about drop, cover, and hold on. And you may have done exercises like this in school before you ever got to San Francisco State. You drop. When the earthquake hits, you drop, you get under cover, and you hold on to the table because you don't want to be flung out from underneath the table. And with this shaking, that can happen. So hold on to the table or desk or whatever it is. Um, I want you to know what you're going to do. And if there are other people in your that you live with, your friends and family, your loved ones, where are they going to go? Um, if you're in bed, stay in bed, but maybe cover your head with a pillow. If you've got shelves over your, this is something that my mom was always worried about. I played softball in high school, well, all through, throughout school. And I had my softball trophies over my bed and they all had a little metal bat attached to them. And my mom was always worried that my trophies were going to fall down and stab me in the night. <laughs> So just be careful what you've got over your head um, when you're sleeping. Maybe remove those heavy things or pointy things. Don't go to a doorway for protection. That's not advised anymore. Um, have maybe a safety kit, a first aid kit, a three-day a supply of water and other non-perishable food, canned food. Um, don't light candles unless you know there's no gas leak. Um, have a flashlight and battery handy. Don't run outside, you're safer inside. What, if you're outside though, you should move to an open area. That's this bottom one. If you're outside, stay outside, move to an open area that's away from buildings, away from street lights, electricity lines, and stay in an open area until the shaking stops. So maybe you go to a park or um 
heck in the middle of the street if you had to. Um, but just watch out for cars too, eh? Driving cars might not feel it. A lot of people who were driving during the Loma Prieta quake didn't feel it. Um, if you're inside, um, stay away from the windows and any items that could fall. Okay, light fixtures, a TV, a, other heavy, heavy furniture that might tilt, bookcases, for example. Okay, that's what you want to do. Oh, 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 wait, where was I? I got lost track. This is stuff, it, this is just a brand name. They, they, there are other companies that make this stuff, but they make like this museum putty that you can put like a little gob of it under vases and then stick it on the top of your bookshelf or whatever so that it won't fall during an earthquake. So if you've got things that are valuable or, you know, family heirlooms or something, you want to protect them. You want to strap heavy furniture, like this is a china cabinet. You want to strap it to the wall because tall, heavy things can tip. It's, you know, if the shaking is a particular direction, it's going to tip. Um, there are other guidelines. So it can be much more specific, the guidelines that you can find online. Strap your water heater down. Um, in the kitchen, you know, make sure you, you could put closures on your cabinet doors so that things don't fly open. Closures on your china cabinet, you know, the museum putty on top, bottom of the vases. Um, strap framed things to the wall better. All right. Um, I have a question. Yeah, you bet. So growing up in school, we always had earthquake drills and they said, go under a desk, cover your head and neck with your hands or go in a doorway. What if you have nowhere in your house to go other than a doorway? Cause like there's one table in my house and I personally wouldn't trust to be under it and it's under a window. So like what am I supposed to do, for example, if there's basically nowhere else to be except a doorway, like what would you recommend? Your bathtub? a shower. There's nothing hanging in there, there mostly. And the bathtub itself probably won't break. And if it's away from windows, you're probably okay. Um, if your bed is away from windows, um, if, there's, if there aren't heavy things that might fall onto you, maybe that's a good place to be. Um, Yeah, if all else fails, a doorway is your, if that's your last option, then then choose it. But um, which doorway? You gotta watch out for your hands though, because you don't want the door to swing closed and like smash your hands. Mm -hmm. That's another way you can hurt yourself. Um, yeah, you, you should go, you should find, find wherever it is, find a place that is farthest away from things that will fall down and from things like window and from windows. If there's an inner room in your apartment, that's why I'm thinking bathroom. Like maybe that's an inner room that might be safer. Um, maybe that helps. Does it? <laughs> Um, I mean, my shower has a glass door. <laughs> well, yeah, but those are like, those, that shower is tempered glass, so it shouldn't shatter. Or if, okay. it, does, if it does break, it should be safe. Okay, so that'll that's probably what, be my last resort then. <laughs> yeah. Just because those, those usually that have like tile or a plastic enclosure in it, I, I just think that might be a safer place. The last thing I want to show you is um, I mentioned tsunami are um, possible during some earthquakes, especially subduction zone earthquakes, because subduction zone, earth zone earthquakes might be on thrust faults that have a vertical offset. And so it can push, um, push up a column of water that generates the tsunami wave. And so I wanted to show you some stuff about tsunami, particularly this December 26, 2004 tsunami. Um, people were on vacation. Okay, before this starts, notice the, the, the legend. Dark blue colors are zero feet. Um, red colors are 10 feet plus. 
this is the tsunami wave amplitude. So that's how high the wave was. So we're talking in the red, they're saying even over three meters, that's over like, that's well over 10 feet high, a, a wave of water. And it does not come as one giant wave necessarily. It's one big push of water onto the land. Um, this shows the uh, Indian Ocean and the wave that uh, was generated during that earthquake. It shows you the a long section of fault that was broken. And everywhere there's a coastline that has a red line. They had over 10 feet of water come on shore. Even it was like between, there was a lot of water even in Eastern Africa along Somalia's coast, along Madagascar and some of these islands. The I remember when that tsunami happened when I was a kid and seeing like the footage of the waves on the news and like people yes. just screaming and running. It was terrifying. Yeah. And did you also see that because after the wave, before the wave runs up and in between waves, because there can be multiple tsunami waves, the water pulls out because of the because of the wave, it has troughs as well as swells. And when the water pulls out, it created an open beach and there were fish flopping around on the beach. People went down to investigate. Then the next wave came and they were caught. You have to be careful. You don't just run down to check it out after it happened. You wait hours because the next wave might take an hour before it arrives, depending on where you are compared to where the tsunami wave started. Um, so the first, and there are tsunami warning signs on the coast here. You know, the tsunami could be ge generated in Japan's subduction zone and arrive on our coast. Uh, in fact, there was a warning after this, the, that tsunami, um, after the nuclear reactor was damaged. So um, yes, the, a wave pushes on shore and it picks up whatever, whatever is in its way on the way, trees, cars, houses, it's gonna wipe things out. And if you're, you might think like, oh, I'm a good swimmer, I could swim this thing. Well, okay, fine, but probably you're not a good swimmer with trees and cars floating around you. And it's not it's turbulent water. So this is a picture of one of the waves coming in. This was the beach out here uh, in front of this line of trees. And you can see the wave just pushing on shore. It's not a, one of these giant curling waves that you see in cartoons or whatever. Um, this shows how long it took here. Oh, sorry, this was, um, a, a, a tsunami generated from an earthquake in Chile in 2010. And this sent out a wave that intersected Hawaii. So Hawaii was at risk. We were at risk too, but we're kind of protected by the, the way that our coast kind of curves out and curves in. We have some co protections that way. Um, this is how long it took, three hours, six hours, nine hours, 12 hours, 15 hours later, the tsunami hit Hawaii. And it wasn't until 24 hours later that it reached Japan. So it can take a long time after you hear about in the news that there was an earthquake that it could arrive. So be careful if you hear about one of the a Japanese earthquake and a tsunami coming. It's not necessarily smart to run down to the beach and look because there could be a tsunami wave coming. There are signs like this on our coast. Um, uh, so, oh wait, I was gonna, okay. This, this is a similar damage. It looks like the Sumatra earthquake. This, this is a picture taken after that Chilean earthquake. Um, and what happened there is they actually had, remember what we we're talking about vertical motion on faults. Well, so some areas can rise up out of the water, like piers, this happens and it has happened in places on the west coast of Italy where the piers have come up out of the water. And this is an area that sank and so sunk a bunch of trees 
and now is inundated with water um, ever since. So it can have um, a local effect that way too. That is my last slide. And um, yeah, that was a lot, I know. I want to show you a couple, I promise to show you a couple of things. Are there questions before I go to the other websites to show you some of those? Yeah, I actually have a quick question. Okay, go for it. Um, is that evac e evacuation route, is that the um, only um, safety tip that they have when it comes to, to a tsunami? The smartest thing you can do is get uphill. Get as high as you can, fast as you can. Um, that could be in, a, in an apartment building. If you were to go to the fifth floor or something, that could be okay. Um, you know, as long as it seems like it's a sturdy building, especially if it's not right on the coast, uh, people were in hotel rooms filming the tsunami and they seem to be safe. So I think being on a high story floor or climbing a mount, climbing a hill. Um, I'm right by the beach, a couple blocks away. I think I'm only at an elevation of maybe a hundred feet or something. So I'm up pretty high, but there's a hill up behind my house. The first thing I'm going to do is climb that hill and just get out of the way and wait until the damage is done and then um, come back down. That's the safest thing you can do. So these evacuation routes, I think they send you in your car. So they send you in a like back up 92 to get out of the way, but everybody's going to be going that way. So if you're on foot, just run uphill. And you saw the size of the waves, um, 10 foot, maybe 15 feet. If you can get up above that, you're you should be okay. So see the damage here was done sort of in the lowlands. If you were to just climb this hill and get up into that grassy hillside, you could have watched all the damage happen and you would be safe. Okay. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Oh, wait, no, I think I answered that question. Okay, okay, I'm gonna stop sharing that. And real quick, so what I'm gonna do now is um, pull up the US, I've got the USGS site ready to roll here. Let me just share this window. Okay, just so that you, you can um, do this yourselves. So when you go to Quake, I just type in quake, not even earthquake. Quake.usgs.gov brings you to this page. This is where you can report it. Did you feel it? You can report an earthquake there. It takes you through a bunch of um, questions. And um, you can also go look at the information for some of these earthquakes. So let's see if we can find a biggish earthquake that happened recently. Okay, here's one, Papua New Guinea. Okay, this is a subduction zone earthquake, probably. Let's go check it out and see what kind of data it has. So um, here's the shake map. This is the community based on, ooh, not good. That's not telling us much. This is the one generated by the USGS. So it doesn't seem like there was a lot of shaking actually. It's fairly light, it's in the blue colors. It's not a lot, a lot of red shaking um not see regional origin i'm looking for the beach ball diagram there are the beach balls okay um this does, i'm not sure that this is the final solution but um what this is showing is tension on the top and bottom and the kind of compressional are on the side so this looks like it was mostly strike slip, maybe with um, a little bit of tension, so normal fault. That's, that's how I interpret that beach ball. Um, they look both similar. So that's what I was saying is like, you can go, sometimes they're clearer than that one, but you can go and get information from these different quakes and learn more about them. And now that you're aware of, you're aware of, you know, how to interpret some of this data, you can um, get more information out of the, out of the site. Here's a 4.5 in Albania. 
let's come on. Oh, I guess I have to go here. It doesn't look like, I mean, it's a 4.5, so it, it doesn't have a lot of shaking and okay. So there's no, it doesn't look like there's a beach ball for that one. So not every time, I guess we got a little bit lucky with that last one. Uh, I just wanted you to see all of, all that you can see on this website. So this is global information. Um, you can get these, I think the red are the most recent and the size of the circle corresponds to the magnet, the Richter magnitude. So here's a 5.0 on the Kamchatka Peninsula. So this is another subduction zone regional information. This is showing you seismicity all around this area. It's just littered with earthquakes around this area. You can zoom out. There are all your earthquakes. Here's the trench. So that's the subduction trench. So if I, we were to map the depth of these earthquakes, where would the shallowest earthquakes occur? This is a great quiz question or exam question. Where are the deepest earthquakes on this map? Where are the shallowest earthquakes? Now I know you're not familiar with Kamchatka necessarily, but I pointed out the trench. So we've got Pacific plate here, North American plate here. Does anyone want to volunteer? Even Kay. <laughs> Well, the deepest, largest quakes occur around subduction zones near the trenches, right? The shallowest near the trenches. The deepest, oh, okay. furthest inland. The shallowest near the trenches. Because if you look at my hands, the, the subduction, the, the earthquakes happen along the subducting crust. So if this is the subducting oceanic crust, and here's the overlying Kamchatka Peninsula, the earthquakes that are shallowest are nearest the are are closest to where that plate starts to dive down, so mm -hmm. closest to the trench. These and then are, farther inland, they become more intense. Well, I'm not. Well, that depends on just how much earth was broken. I'm or not deeper. Sure, deeper, deeper is the key. The size doesn't depend on the depth. They they don't ne necessarily go hand in hand. But the, because we can have shallow big earthquakes, we can have deep mm -hmm. big earthquakes. Um, but the shallow ones are closer, to, they maybe pose a bigger hazard to us because they're close to us physically, mm -hmm. geographically. The deeper ones are deeper down, they're further away from us. So there's more time for those seismic waves to die off. And okay. so it won't be as much damage. So shallower near the trench, deeper, inland but like behind the volcanic arc remember the subduction subducting plate is bending down and there's melting happening that's forming this volcanic arc right here and then the deepest earthquakes will be down there okay okay cool i'm gonna stop that and let's see if uh, i don't have the link handy but i beg um uh, earthquake hazard map. I never remember the website, so I just go, I just navigate to it. They, this is all about preparing for an earthquake, this resilience program. And then it has links to the hazard viewer. That's what I'm after. So this is the one that I said, like you can't, I can't put in a address anymore, but you can go to this and look. So it's got some layer turned. I think this is the landslide layer that's turned on. So I'm going to turn that off. And then um, so ha historic wildfires, fire hazard, flood zones, landslide hazards. Then we get down into earthquake shaking. That's what I'm after. So earthquake shaking. Um, and then you can control let's see wait where can you go oh it's down here further down so um you go down here and it says berryessa fault Cal calaveras fault calaveras fault concord 
Great Valley or Green Valley Hayward. So Hayward Northern and Southern segments. So I've just said, okay, please plot what the shaking would look like if there was an earthquake along this segment of the Hayward Fault. That's where I got that map from the lecture. So if you live in a particular place, like for me, I'm gonna say I could go down and maybe um, San Gregorio. So I'll hit San Gregorio because that's the I'm between the San Gregorio and the San Andreas. Can I do two at once? Yes. So peninsula segment. Let me turn off the. Did I turn the Hayward off? Okay, Hayward off, and then we're on peninsula and San Gregorio. And if I do this, I zoom in to where I live. And here's my hazard map. There we go. So I live pretty close, but I live between the San Andreas Fault and the San Gregorio Fault that's out here. So this is what the shaking would look like. So I'm in a pretty, um, I'm a pretty intense shaking. So this is the, let's see, what color are, do we correspond to? It's um, very strong. No, it's severe shaking. Great. Severe shaking. Uh, my house was first built in 1914, I think. So it didn't, Pacifica actually was settled kind of after the 1906 earthquake because San Franciscans were moving out of the city or finding beach houses or something. <laughs> um, so it didn't go through the 1906 quake, but it survived the 1989 quake, which is, that makes me feel better. Anyway, I encourage you um, to go to the site. I've given you a link. I think I've given you a link. Yes, in the lab folder, lab six, virtual. Maybe I didn't. Okay, I'm gonna make sure that in the supplemental information right after class, I'm gonna add a link to that um the hazard viewer so that you can go right to it and look at your own hazards and i'm going to add a link to the quake site on the usgs so that you can go look at earthquakes i'll put them right there and that's all i've got for today so um ha i'm happy to answer any questions on i thought we would be done before noon i guess not but i'm happy to answer any questions on lab five lab six to help you get those done or about the exam. Otherwise, good luck. I will, I, I'm still gonna hold um, study group tomorrow between 11 and one. So drop in whenever you like during that time, I'll be online um, and ask any questions about those labs. I, want, I really want you to get them done before you start taking the exam. Okay, uh, so I'll, I'll see you tomorrow. What is there a question? Yeah, I have, I have questions for lab four. <laughs> lab four, okay, sure. Uh, it was mostly on like the last two. I was just confused on how to do them. Okay. Let me switch over to that. I just opened it. Okay, stop, share. Let me share this one. Okay, here's lab four. And you said the last questions. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is the very last one. Is this the, the diagram you're after? Oh, uh, the one or after it. This. That, this one, yeah. Okay, so this is related to that diagram. So you're, mm -hmm. you're putting in the order of events just like the other cross sections here. Okay. Right? And, um, the only age information you're given is this, Paleozoic okay. and Cenozoic. That's all you know. Okay. So, so um, what I suggested to everybody was that after you put these events, the, the layers in order, you can estimate that the earliest formed or the earliest the oldest rock units you can maybe say happened in the early paleozoic mm -hmm. 
middle, and then the latest event, latest units, call them late Paleozoic. And then you can start saying, okay, this could be early, early Cenozoic and late Cenozoic, if you like. Um, the Mesozoic is missing. Oh. So it's a whole big piece of time, right? So maybe that's when the unconformity formed, was sometime during the Mesozoic. That's why you gave us that map of all the different uh, geological periods. Ah. Y yes, I wanted, yes. You mean the, the geologic time? Yeah. Scale. Yeah. Uh, I don't remember where I gave that to you, though. <laughs> I should give you another. Maybe I gave it to you in, the, in the la that lab folder. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wanted you to realize that um, the, when, when the Paleozoic happened, you know, those are the oldest life forms. We went over that at the beginning. This is like more when mammals started to reign. Um, but you don't need to get any more detail than early, middle, late, early, middle, late, Paleozoic and Cenozoic. Okay, because that confused me. I was like, where, where do I get the years? <laughs> yeah, you don't need numerical time. You don't, you don't need a num, an, an age, a numerical age. There we go. You can just use early, early Paleozoic down here, middle, late Paleozoic, early Cenozoic, late Cenozoic. Okay, and then you remember that you need to write a short paragraph explaining your reasoning um, to determine the age, the numerical age. Well, you're, you're going to use a, a name age of the SSB unit. That's this one. Okay. So you need to make sure because your points, the way that I graded this, the points are assigned. Make sure you mention these things that the age of the units that are older than SSB and what, how you're, deter, how you're, you, what principle are you using to determine that, like these principles. So mention which principle you're using and then the age of the unit that's younger than SSB and the principle that you're using to, to determine the youngest age. Okay. Okay. So, like so make sure you include those in that. Uh, and, and like the principles are what we've learned at the beginning of the lab, right? Totally. Okay. You're using cross-cutting relationships, original horizontality, superposition. You're using all of those. Awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. Have a nice weekend. You, you too. Good luck. Anybody else? Any other questions? I have a question. Uh-oh. Uh oh, okay. Sorry, you go first. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, for lab 5B, where it says to like sketch the topographic uh, map, do we have to sketch it the way it is on the, uh, on the Google Earth? So um, I think what you're asking is, the, so for question 29 that asks you to, to sketch a cross section from the basically the middle of the Pacific Ocean, across South America, across the Atlantic Ocean to Africa? That mm -hmm. one? Yes. So just like the profiles that you get when you do an elevation profile using Google Earth, you can go ahead and generate the profile using Google Earth for that transect. But what I want you to do is sketch it yourself and to make sure you add in and annotate your sketch to show all the different features that you should be able to see in that cross section. So I want you to show, make sure you show the ridge that forms the spreading centers. You're, you should cross two spreading centers. You're crossing a subduction zone, so you should show the volcanic arc. You should show where the earthquakes uh, form within the subduction zone, the shallow ones and the deep ones, where those go. Be because I want you to try to put all of this together and to like show me that you understand, okay, so the subduction goes like this beneath the volcanic arc. Here are the earthquakes. You could just put little stars or something, asterisks. You know, the, the volcanic arc, you can show like draw a little magma body in there, a little smoke, like ash or something coming out. Um, to show me where the volcanoes should be. 
and it, you know, it doesn't have to be exact because this is a lot of information on one piece of paper. So you're just going to have a little blip of for the vol volcanics for, for the mountain belt that is the Andes. Oh, okay. Do you, okay. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Okay, so make sure that you mark all of these things. Oh, you, wait, I'm not sharing that screen. Um, so on this list here, make sure that on your sketch, you show where sea level is. You could just draw a line or little waves across um, in blue, if you like, where sea level is. Show those topographic features. So the, the ridges at the mid-ocean ridges, the volcanic arc, the subduction trench, those topographic features. Make sure you show the earthquake hypocenters. Okay, so along the subducting plate. The Google Earth doesn't generate anything below the surface. So you're drawing this in beneath the surface. Oh, okay. And you're gonna draw the mark the volcanoes, and then you're gonna mark the plate different plate names and where the plate boundaries are show the arrows of the direction that the plates are moving. Um, and the scale, you're gonna, I mean, you can use Google Earth for the scale because it, it'll show you the height, the elevation above sea level, the depth below sea level, and then you can measure the distance on Google Earth. Just like measure the Atlantic Ocean and then make your scale like 3000 kilometers right there. Oh, okay. So you don't have to figure any of that out. You just have to like find the information and then jot it down. Okay, so don't worry on the profile. You don't have to get every little blip and every little thing that's on the, the profile that Google Earth has, as long as you show the overall topographic features for me. Oh, all right, thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Michael, did you have another question or who was it? Yeah, um, I just had a um, quick ones for 5A real quick. Is it okay 5A. if I... Uh, yeah, let so me... So if I sh share my uh, screen? Sure, you bet. Let me stop sharing here and then I have to... All right, now you can. Okay. So, sorry, there's a... Somebody at my door. Is it okay if... Um... Yeah, go for it. Do what you got to do. Bianca, did you have a question too? Oh, I forgot to go to Clubhouse. So sorry about that. No problem. Oh, sorry. That's a um, 5B. It's a 5A or 5B? It's, I said um, 5A. 5A. Okay. Now I see your screen now. Mm -hmm. So for 5A, I just um, have a couple questions to go. Um, the, um, for these, um, Two questions. When you say describe the rocks and soils, yeah. Did um did you mean like the rocks and soils of the of the volcano of Mount Hood? No, um, no. isn't this the the uh, it, uh, to the address that what geologic unit is that street address? So I asked you to put in a street address and to look at the geologic map in Google Earth. Did you find your your street address or? A street address for that? Oh, I haven't found my street address yet. So put that in in Google Earth, and then you want to show display the geologic map layer, so that the geologic map of California. And then when you zoom in to your address, then you're gonna click on the the color unit on which your house, apartment, whatever sits. And it will give you its age and a description of the unit. 
So all you have to do is write down a bit of that description here. Okay. I can show you if you'd like. Um, yeah, sure, actually. Okay, you have to stop sharing though. Okay. Let me... Okay, so um, I'll use the example because someone asked to see uh, the cliff house. Sorry, let me get this going. There's the cliff house. Someone was asking about the whether it would fall into the ocean and uh, it's on rocks. It's, it's not gonna go anywhere. The, <laughs> that's gonna fall down. But we could use that as an example. We could find out what geology, it, uh, what the geology is underneath the cliff house. So I'm going to turn on the age of the ocean. Wait, it's up. I need to make this bigger. Oh, geologic units of California. There we go. Okay, so there's the geologic map right? And you have a bunch of different colored units. So if I click on any of these, it brings up, it says Franciscan Melange. So everywhere it's pink is Franciscan Melange. It's Melange of, which means mixture, of fragmented and sheared Franciscan complex rocks. And it will give you, if you click on detailed description, it gives you a whole bunch more information. Um, Sheared mudstone and argillite enclosing tectonic blocks of gray wacky greenstone, cherts, or pentonite, blah, blah, blah. And it says Jurassic to Cretaceous, so it gives you the age. That's where I was hoping you would get your information. So for the case of the cliff house, it looks like it's, it's on that Franciscan stuff. Yeah, same unit. But a lot of houses are on quaternary like loose sediments that aren't even lithified yet, like quaternary sand deposits. So it says extensive marine and non-marine sand deposits generally near the coast or desert playas. So obviously this is near the coast in our case. Um, sand deposits in coastal areas, including beach sand and aeolian dunes. I mean sand dunes and aeolian just means wind blown and their quaternary age, which is right at the, it's, it's the youngest age on the geologic time scale. Okay, so yeah. can, uh, you, you got that, you put your address in right here in the search box and it'll take you right to where you, where you wanna look. Uh, okay, so um, um, also uh, another real quick question. So um, sure. just by getting the, uh, the color coding of like each rocks, is that on um, part of like um, any other download or, or does it just come with Google Earth in general? No, that's, so there were two files. Let me, I'll stop sharing this and I'll share my, my browser and I'll show you where to look. Okay, so I'm back, ah, oh, shoot, I lost it. Back in iLearn. I'm going to go to the home page and I'm going to go to week four, lab four folder. So lab four folder, it says, um, so you had your worksheets and then, wait a minute. That's not the right lab. Sorry. <laughs> it's lab five. <laughs> I'm like, wait a minute, wrong lab. Lab five, lab five folder. Um, it says that you need numbers one, two, and three below. So you should have downloaded the worksheets. The, this, this map of geologic map of California, it's a KMZ file that you open in Google Earth. And then you also download this topo map data that's also open in Google Earth. So you download a KMZ and a KML file. You're going to go into Google Earth to the file menu and open those files from there. Okay. Got that? You know yeah. how to do that? Mm -hmm. Okay. So that you should also have that topo map. That you need the topo map to do the um, all of the Mount Hood questions. Yeah, I have the topo map. Good. Okay. Um, and then just another real, real one real quick question. Um, it was just about um um, trying to remember which question. Oh yeah, um, it was about like 
finding the maximum and minimum ele elevation between um, the um, add path one. Um, is that across Mount Hood? Yeah. Okay, I guess I better go read the question. Let me just go look real quick. It's, but, question, it's question number 11. 11, thanks. Um, I just have to find it real, is it this one? Oh, where is it? Oh, it's here. Sorry. Okay. Okay, 11. Okay. Um, you now will construct a topographic po profile of Mount Hood running east to west. Okay. You're adding a path. Okay. And you're showing the elevation profile. Okay. Okay. So, um, all, yeah, that's literally all I want you to do is once you add the path across Mount Hood, you're, you're, you can show the elevation profile and you can see, um, you can see the high and the low points on there. So you should be able to read the elevation. Like as you move your pointer along that transect as, and along that profile, you'll see your pointer follow the transect and you can see exactly like where you are. And so you can find the lowest point and it should display the elevation in that screen. It's either in the profile screen or on the bottom of Google Earth it will show your elevation of your pointer. Yeah, um, it, yeah, it did show, yeah, it did show it. My, my question was, um, did you want like the uh, maximum minimum elevation from like one side to the other? Or just from the like- total. Just the total. Oh, just the total? Yeah. Okay. So and, we're, yeah. And then miles or like, centimeters kilometers oh god don't measure it in centimeters do it either do it in miles or in kilometers and just okay. pick one and stick with it as far as like choosing your units if you're going to use miles use miles and feet if you're going to use kilometers use kilometers and meters to describe distances okay okay mm -hmm. any other and questions yeah. Uh, no, I okay. think that's slope question too. The slope that you also read on that elevation profile. Oh yeah, the slope. Um, I just saw that it was like um in the top right hand corner. Um, is the slope supposed to be like a percentage? Yes. Okay. It's a then... Percentage, and it's going to show you a positive number and a negative number. The positive number is the west side where the the slope goes up to the peak. The negative number is the east side where it goes down from the peak to the the bottom of the hill of the mountain. Oh, uh, okay. So then you can compare the east and the west, okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that's about it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Have a great weekend. Uh, you too. Good luck with finishing those laps. Thank you. You're welcome. Bianca, do you have any questions? Okay, well about the cliff house, I want to finish answering that question. So the cliff house is on Franciscan Melange. So these are probably actually gray wackies and serpentinites. Let's see if we can tell. I'll turn this off and go see the cliff house. So along the beach, it's rocky. It's supported by rock. There's the old bathhouse. I don't think that's going anywhere. It's been there a long time. And, it, you know, there's rock falls every once in a while, but that's in a pretty sturdy position, I'd say. Yeah, probably sandstones. I think this is the serpentinite up here where it's greenish. Mm 
I'm gonna go down to Daily City and see. Do you need help? Are you busy? Um, I'm, no, I'm done actually. Bianca, I'm gonna sign off now if you don't have questions. Okay? Bye, good luck.